Hey guys, there was a lot of positive response on my first reading video, so I've decided to continue on with it. I still don't know if I'll be doing the whole book or not, but maybe it'll be something to do every now and then when I don't have the time to do more elaborate videos. So previously we read the prologue and the White Walkers attacked some of the Night's Watch. And now we're moving on to a Bran point of view chapter. The morning had dawned clear and cold with a crispness that hinted at the end of summer. They set forth at daybreak to see a man beheaded, twenty in all, and Bran rode among them nervous with excitement. This was the first time he had been deemed old enough to go with his lord father and his brothers to see the king's justice done. It was the ninth year of summer and the seventh of Bran's life. The man had been taken outside a small holdfast in the hills. Rob thought he was a wildling, his sword sworn to man's raider, the king beyond the wall. It made Bran's skin prickle to think of it. He remembered the half tales old Nan told them. The wildlings were cruel men, she said, slavers and slayers and thieves. They consorted with giants and ghouls, stole girl children in the dead of night, and drank blood from polished horns. And their women lay with the others in the long night to sire terrible half human children. But the man they found bound hand and foot to the hold fast wall awaiting the king's justice was old and scrawny, not much taller than Rob. He had lost both ears and a finger to frostbite, and he dressed all in black, the same as a brother of the Night's Watch, except that his furs were ragged and greasy. The breath of man and horse mingled, steaming, in the cold morning air as his lord father had the man cut down from the wall and dragged before them. Rob and John sat tall and still on their horses, with Bran between them on his pony, trying to seem older than seven, trying to pretend that he'd seen all this before. A faint wind blew through the holdfast gate. Over their heads flapped the banner of the Starks of Winterfell, a grey dire wolf racing across an ice-wide field. Bran's father sat solemnly on his horse, long brown hair staring in the wind. His closely trimmed beard was shot with white, making him look older than his thirty-five years. He had a grim cast to his grey eyes this day, and he seemed not at all the man who would sit before the fire in the evening and talk softly of the age of heroes and the children of the forest. He had taken off father's face, Bran thought, and donned the face of Lord Stark of Winterfell. There were questions asked and answers given there in the chill of the morning, but afterward Bran could not recall much of what had been said. Finally, his lord father gave a command, and two of his guardsmen dragged the ragged man to the ironwood stump in the centre of the square. They forced his head down onto the hard black wood. Lord Eddard Stark dismounted and his ward, Theon Greyjoy, brought forth the sword. Ice, that sword was called. It was as wide across as a man's hand, and taller even than Rob. The blade was Valyrian steel, spell-forged and dark as smoke. Nothing held an edge like Valyrian steel. His father peeled off his gloves and handed them to Jory Castle, the captain of the household guard. He took hold of ice with both hands and said, In the name of Robert of the House Baratheon, the first of his name, King of the Andals and the Roynar and the First Men, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms and Protector of the Realm, by the word of Eddard of House Stark, Lord of Winterfell and Warden of the North, I do sentence you to die. He lifted the great sword high above his head. Bran's bastard brother John Snow moved closer. Keep the pony well in hand, he whispered, and don't look away. Father will know if you do. Bran kept his pony well in hand and did not look away. His father took off the man's head with a single short stroke. Blood sprayed out across the snow, as red as summer wine. One of the horses reared and had to be restrained to keep from bolting. Bran could not take his eyes off the blood. The snows around the stump drank it in eagerly 
reddening as he watched. The head bounced off a thick root and rolled. It came up near Greyjoy's feet. Theon was a lean, dark youth of nineteen who found everything amusing. He laughed, put his boot on the head, and kicked it away. Ass, John muttered, low enough so Greyjoy did not hear. He put a hand on Bran's shoulder, and Bran looked over at his bastard brother. You did well. John told him solemnly. John was fourteen, an old hand at justice. It seemed colder on the long ride back to Winterfell, though the wind had died by then, and the sun was higher in the sky. Bran rode with his brothers, well ahead of the main party, his pony struggling hard to keep up with their horses. The deserter died bravely, Rob said. He was big and broad and growing every day, with his mother's colouring, the fair skin, red-brown hair, and blue eyes of the Tullys of Riverrun. He had courage at the least. No, John Snow said quietly. It was not courage. This one was dead of fear. You could see it in his eyes, Stark. John's eyes were a grey so dark they seemed almost black, but there was little they did not see. He was of an age with Rob, but they did not look alike. John was slender where Rob was muscular, dark where Rob was fair, graceful and quick where his half-brother was strong and fast. Rob was not impressed. The others take his eyes, he swore. He died well. Or is he to the bridge? Done, John said, kicking his horse forward. Rob cursed and followed, and they galloped off down the trail, Rob laughing and hooting, John silent and intent. The hooves of their horses kicked up showers of snow as they went. Bran did not try to follow. His pony could not keep up. He had seen the ragged man's eyes, and he was thinking of them now. After a while, the sound of Rob's laughter receded, and the woods grew silent again. So deep in thought was he that he never heard the rest of the party until his father moved up to ride beside him. Are you well, Bran? he asked, not unkindly. Yes, father, Bran told him. He looked up. Wrapped in his furs and leathers, mounted on his great war horse, his lord father looked over him like a giant. Rob says the man died bravely, but John says he was afraid. What do you think? his father asked. Bran thought about it. Can a man still be brave if he's afraid? That is the only time a man can be brave, his father told him. Do you understand why I did it? He was a wildling, Bran said. They carry off women and sell them to the others. His lord father smiled. Old man has been telling you stories again. In truth, the man was an oathbreaker, a deserter from the Night's Watch. No man is more dangerous. The deserter knows his life is forfeit if he is taken, so he will not flinch from any crime, no matter how vile. But you mistake me. The question was not why the man had to die, but why I must do it. Bran had no answer for that. King Robert has a headsman, he said uncertainly. He does, his father admitted, as did the Targaryen kings before him. Yet our way is the older way. The blood of the first men still flows in the veins of the Starks, and we hold the belief that the man who passes the sentence should swing the sword. If you would take a man's life, you owe it to him to look into his eyes and hear his final words. And if you cannot bear to do that, then perhaps the man does not deserve to die. One day, Bran, you will be Rob's bannerman, holding a keep of your own for your brother and your king, and justice will fall to you. When that day comes, you must take no pleasure in the task, but neither must you look away. A ruler who hides behind paid execution soon forgets what death is. That was when John reappeared on the crest of the hill before them. He waved and shouted down at them, Father, Bran, come quickly, see what a robber's found. Then he was gone again. Jory rode up beside them. Trouble, my lord. Beyond a doubt, his lord father said. Come, let us see what mischief my sons have rooted out now. He sent his horse into a trot. Jory and Bran and the rest came after. They found Rob on the riverbank north of the bridge, with John still mounted beside him. The late summer snows had been heavy this moon turn. Rob stood knee-deep in white, his hood pulled back so the sun shone in his hair. He was cradling something in his arm, 
while the boys talked in hushed, excited voices. The riders picked their way carefully through the drifts, groping for solid footing on the hidden, uneven ground. Jory Castle and Theon Greyjoy were the first to reach the boys. Greyjoy was laughing and joking as he rode. Bran heard the breath go out of him. Gods, he exclaimed, struggling to keep control of his horse as he reached for his sword. Rob, get away from it, he called as his horse reared under him. Rob grinned and looked up from the bundle on his arms. She can't hurt you, he said. She's dead, Jory. Bran was afire with curiosity by then. He would have spurred the pony faster, but his father made them dismount before the bridge and approach on foot. Bran jumped off and ran. By then, John, Jory, and Theon Greyjoy had all dismounted as well. What in the seven hells is it? Greyjoy was saying. A wolf, Rob told him. It's a freak, Greyjoy said. Look at the size of it. Bran's heart was thumping in his chest as he pushed through a waist-high drift to his brother's side. Half buried in the blood-stained snow, a huge dark shape slumped in death. Ice had formed in its shaggy grey fur, and the faint smell of corruption clung to it like a woman's perfume. Bran glimpsed blind eyes crawling with maggots, a wide mouth full of yellowed teeth. But it was the size of it that made him gasp. It was bigger than his pony, twice the size of the largest hound in his father's kennel. It's no freak, John said calmly. That's a dire wolf. They grow larger than the other kind. Theon Greyjoy said, There's not been a dire wolf sighted south of the wall in two hundred years. I see one now, John replied. Bran tore his eyes away from the monster. That was when he noticed the bundle in Rob's arms. He gave a cry of delight and moved closer. The pup was a tiny ball of grey-black fur, its eyes still closed. It nuzzled blindly against Rob's chest as he cradled it, searching for milk among his leathers, making a sad little whimpery sound. Bran reached out hesitantly. Go on, Rob told him. You can touch him. Bran gave the pup a quick nervous stroke, then turned as John said, Here you go. His half-brother put a second pup into his arms. There are five of them. Bran sat down in the snow and hugged the wolf pup to his face. Its fur was soft and warm against his cheek. Die wolves loose in the realm after so many years, muttered Holland, the master of horse. I like it not. It is a sign, Jory said. Father frowned. This is only a dead animal, Jory, he said. Yet he seemed troubled. Snow crunched under his boots as he moved around the body. Do we know what killed her? There's something in the throat, Rob told him, proud to have found the answer before his father even asked. There, just under the jaw. His father knelt and gripped under the beast's head with his hand. He gave a yank and held it up for all to see. A foot of shattered antler. Time snapped off, all wet with blood. A sudden silence descended over the party. The men looked at the antler uneasily, and no one dared to speak. Even Bran could sense their fear, though he did not understand. His father tossed the antler to the side and cleansed his hands in the snow. I'm surprised she lived long enough to whelp, he said. His voice broke the spell. Maybe she didn't, Jory said. I've heard tales. Maybe the bitch was already dead when the pups came. Born with the dead, another man put in. Worse luck. No matter, said Holland. They'd be dead soon enough, too. Bran gave a wordless cry of dismay. The sooner the better, Theon Greyjoy agreed. He drew his sword. Give the beast here, Bran. The little thing squirmed against him, as if it heard and understood. No, Bran cried out fiercely. It's mine. Put away your sword, Greyjoy, Rob said. For a moment he sounded as commanding as their father, like the lord he would some day be. We will keep these pups. You cannot do that, boy, said Harwin, who was Hullen's son. It'd be a mercy to kill them, Hullen said. Bran looked to his father for rescue, but got only a frown, a furrowed brow. Hullen speaks truly, son. Better a swift death than a hard one from cold and starvation. No. He could feel tears welling in his eyes, and he looked away. He did not want to cry in front of his father. Rob resisted stubbornly. 
So Roderick's red bitch whelped again last week, he said. It was a small litter, only two live pups. She'll have milk enough. She'll rip them apart when they try to nurse. Lord Stark, John said. It was strange to hear him call father that, so formal. Bran looked at him with desperate hope. There were five pups, he told father. Three male, two female. What of it, John? You have five Jewborn children, John said. Three sons, two daughters. The direwolf is the sigil of your house. Your children were meant to have these pups, my lord. Bran saw his father's face change, saw the other men exchange glances. He loved John with all his heart at that moment. Even at seven, Bran understood what his brother had done. The count had come right only because John had admitted himself. He had included the girls, included even Rickon the baby, but not the bastard who bore the surname Snow, the name that custom decreed be given to all those in the north unlucky to be born with no name of their own. Their father understood as well. You want no pup for yourself, John, he asked softly. The dire wolf graces the banners of House Stark, John pointed out. I am no Stark, father. Their lord father regarded John thoughtfully. Rob rushed into the silence he left. I will nurse him myself, father, he promised. I will soak a towel with warm milk and give him suck from that. Me too, Bran echoed. The lord weighed his sons long and carefully with his eyes. Easy to say and harder to do. I will not have you wasting a servant's time with this. If you want these pups, you will feed them yourself. Is that understood? Bran nodded eagerly. The pup squirmed in his grasp, licked at his face with a warm tongue. You must train them as well, their father said. You must train them. The kennel master will have nothing to do with these monsters, I promise you that. And the gods help you if you neglect them, or brutalise them, or train them badly. These are not dogs to beg for treats and slink off at a kick. A dire wolf will rip a man's arm off his shoulder as easily as a dog will kill a rat. Are you sure you want this? Yes, father, Bran said. Yes, Rob agreed. The pups may die anyway, despite all you do. They won't die, Rob said. We won't let them die. Keep them, then. Jory, Desmond, gather up the other pups. It's time we were back to Winterfell. It was not until they were mounted and on their way that Bran allowed himself to taste the sweet air of victory. By then, his pup was snuggled inside his leathers, warm against him, safe for the long ride home. Bran was wondering what to name him. Halfway across the bridge, John pulled up suddenly. What is it, John? Their Lord Father asked. Can't you hear it? Bran could hear the wind in the trees, the clatter of their hooves on the ironwood planks, the whimpering of his hungry pup, but John was listening to something else. There, John said. He swung his horse around and galloped back across the bridge. They watched him dismount where the dire wolf lay dead in the snow, watched him kneel. A moment later, he was riding back to them, smiling. He must have crawled away from the others, John said. All been driven away, their father said, looking at the sixth pup. His fur was white, where the rest of the litter was grey. His eyes were as red as the blood of the ragged man who had died that morning. Bran thought it curious that this pup alone would have opened his eyes while the others were still blind. An albino, Theon Greyjoy said with wry amusement. This one will die even faster than the others. Jon Snow gave his father's ward a long, chilling look. I think not, Greyjoy, he said. This one belongs to me. I hope you guys are still enjoying listening to George R. R. Martin's A Game of Thrones. I myself am about up to here, that's my marker, and um, enjoying it pretty thoroughly. I'd like to thank you for joining me for another ASMR reading video, and I hope to see you next time.